Welcome everyone. My name is Stephen Payne, director of the Bronx County Historical Society. We are so happy to have you spend your Monday afternoon or evening with us for a book talk on the graphic novel Voodoo Macbeth. Today's program is an outgrowth of an ongoing exhibition we have at the Museum of Bronx History on the Allerton Coops here in the Bronx, a complex with a very interesting history. Among other distinctions, it was one of the first interracial housing complexes in the Bronx, and among its early African-American and multiracial residents, were some really amazing and creative individuals. Today's program will focus on Eric Burroughs and Canada Lee, both residents of the Allerton Coops who were in the 1936 pivotal all-black production of Macbeth, directed by a young Orson Welles. The presenter is Norris Burroughs, the son of Eric Burroughs and the author and illustrator of Voodoo Macbeth, a graphic novel that explores the making of the production and the various personalities in it, including Eric Burroughs. Norris grew up in the Allerton Coops and today lives in the UK. We are very happy to have him with us today, and he'll begin by speaking about the history and background of the 1936 production of Macbeth that's the subject of his graphic novel. Take it away, Norris. In 1935, the President Franklin Roosevelt created the Works Progress Administration, one of the many social programs for relieving the effects of the crippling depression currently. He created a um, a special department for uh, theater and a special department for, at the time, Negro theater. That was the, the, the word back then, if any is too young to remember that word and can't relate to it. And he hired Orson Welles and um, Jack Hausman to produce a play and uh, they decided to go with uh, Macbeth, an all-black uh, version of Macbeth, which uh, debuted at the um, in Harlem at the Lafayette Theater, and that was uh, in 1936. Great. If, well, oh, anything I'm saying needs elaboration, or if I'm forgetting anything that um, you know, interesting or important. Yeah, and if, if if members of the audience have questions, feel free to add it to the Q and A, um, and we'll Norris and I will um, go back and forth with some structured conversation for about thirty to forty minutes, and then f about the final twenty five thirty minutes, we'll we'll open it up to audience Q and A, and for those of you who um, are willing, we'd we'd like for those with questions to. Uh, come on temporarily and we'll see, you know, see your face uh, and, and other participants will see your face as well as you ask the question. If you're too shy to do so though, just drop the question in the chat and we'll leave it at that. Um, or in, in the Q and A, I should say. Um, so thank you, Nora. So why don't you talk a little bit about your family history um, before we get, you know, more into uh, Voodoo Macbeth, just a little bit about your family history and especially the Burroughs side, because you have a very interesting family history even before we get to Voodoo Macbeth. This is a picture of my great grandfather who was a reconstruction politician in Galveston. Oh. He looks uh, kind of white, but he was um, mixed mixed blood. I believe he was black, uh, Scots-Irish and uh, Swiss-French and also had some Native American blood. Um, basically reconstruction was a period after the Civil War when they tried to uh, bring more black politicians in, into the fold. So my uh, great-grandfather was, um, sorry, I got my facts a little skewed here. So his name was Norris Wright Cuny. I was named after him. And this is um, an article, very old article about the Cuny family. And, um, there's another picture of him. This was his son, Norris Wright Cuny II. His, um, his son was Charles Burroughs. Um, he was um, illegitimate, so he got um, his, 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 his mother married a fellow named Burroughs, so that's where the name Burroughs came into the situation. But you can see, despite the mustache, the resemblance and um, my father served in the Army Air Corps during World War uh, 
World War II, but prior to that, he um, went to Berlin to study acting. He studied with Erwin Piscator, um, very radical uh, kind of socialist political theater. He studied Shakespeare and acting in German. He learned to speak German pretty fluently. And uh, when he came back to America, sometime around 1932 and started working in the area and came to the attention of uh, of Orson Welles for this particular production. Okay, great. And, and um, is that what remotely about, um, clear? Yeah, yeah, it is. What, what about, um, uh, the, I guess the only thing uh, that, that you could add to that is um, your your grandma and your your father's interesting yes. child. Yes, yeah. yes. My grandmother was a teacher, Williana Burroughs, and um, she actually got pretty high up in the Communist Party in the 20s, and she was invited. The reason my father ended up in Europe was because Williana was invited to Russia um, to, um, yeah, I, I've got, I, I don't have all the facts at my fingertips, but um, she moved, she relocated her three sons to Russia to, to work there uh, during the, um, sorry, you probably have the facts more clearly there because um, it's kind of a matter of record. Um, but my dad didn't particularly like Russia, and he ended up going to Germany to study. My my two uncles stayed there until they uh, were called up for selective service, came back to America to serve in the uh, the war effort. And if if I remember correct, I mean this is going a little off topic, but I said one side of your family that's responsible for. Um... That really wonderful museum in Chicago. The state is it the yes, state? yes. So right. Charles Burroughs, who who grew up in Russia, um, came back to Chicago, and he and his wife opened a museum that became the Dusable Museum of African American History. Uh, it still functions. I think it has a different name now. Yeah. There's so much history here. I'm I'm kind of tripping over myself. Like I can't <laughs> remember the name of the of the political event that my uh, grandmother was invited to by by Stalin. Um, yeah, um, I feel like that, I'm woefully short no, on no, some of the facts there when you put it, putting me on the spot, but- um, No, that's, that's fine, that's fine, Doris. I mean, the topic after all is Voodoo Macbeth. There's just so much interesting, um, you know, so many interesting elements to your family's history. I think uh, I've got some. Hang, hang on. I've got some clippings here that actually will will completely clarify that. That's a picture of Williana. Oh, and we'll we'll ask yeah. you to show that um, during the Q and A too, because I think people might not be able to see it since I'm doing the full screen share right now. Right. Um, but uh, actually, let me stop it. You can you can show the photos now, and then I'll go back to the screen share. Okay, so um, this is her her obituaries. And... Yeah, put it up to the camera a little, and let me let's see. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. So people can at least you can't make out the text probably, but they can at least see you got some incredible family archives there. Yeah, I'm just trying to see if there's any um any notion of um for several years she worked on the Moscow Daily News and from 1937 to 1945 she was the English broadcaster on Soviet radio so there's stuff in here i i wasn't even aware of um i was just trying to find the national yeah there's there's um uh, there's a wiki she has a wiki at wiki Anna. She has a Wikipedia page, so if anyone yeah. is interested, all of the facts would be would be there as to the the name of the um, the organization that she was invited to uh, when she brought the fam with her. Right. And my uh, my grandfather Charles was a postal worker, but he was also a Shakespearean reader. He he kind uh -huh. of acted a little bit, but he did he did readings under the name Brastus Cuneal. So he actually took 
a portion of his father's name, Cuneo Cuny. Wow. <clears throat> um, so why why don't you give some general impressions of your father, you know, while you were growing up in the coops and, you know, did you know too much about, what all did you know about his acting career? I don't know how much you would have been exposed to or not. Well, most of the stuff he did uh, when he came back was in radio and uh, I have some of his scripts here, but he did appear um, in another play with um, with um, Eartha Kitt starring Mrs. Patterson. It was called Mrs. Patterson. And he played a similar kind of demonic character called Mr. D and I actually went to see that when I was about six, six or seven years old. He appeared in one film, briefly speaking, uh, it was a movie called Odds Against Tomorrow, starring Harry Belafonte and uh, Robert Ryan. It was a, a very well-received noir film. He he was, he was appears at, at a PTA meeting and he says, very nice to have met you. That's his one, his one speaking line on film. But, um, so I was aware of his acting, but it, it was pretty much all in the past. He had he had stopped working because I was he was 40 when I was born. So I think he's he stopped working by the time he was 50. He, he wasn't doing much anymore. Yeah, he was kind of a functioning as a very efficient house house husband. Sure, sure. Um, and before we get more into, you know, the your interest in in Voodoo Macbeth and all, um, and the process of researching it, writing it and all, uh, just stick with another person that I already mentioned at the beginning, uh, who lived in the coops, Canada Lee, um, was your family friends with Canada Lee or did your father talk about Canada Lee very much? My father did speak of Canada Lee. I never actually met Canada Lee and, and I did not realize until you, you just told me a couple of weeks ago that he lived in the coops and I'm wondering what years. He lived there. He may may have been instrumental in getting getting us in there because at the time we were living in, in Spanish Harlem, 123rd Street. I think so, he might have moved out by 1949. Oh, uh, OK. Yeah. So, yeah. But he, he still lived in the neighborhood, at least for a few years after that, just not in the coops anymore. You know, like one of those single family homes in in Allerton, you know, two or three family homes in Allerton, maybe. Um, so I, I saw him in the film Lifeboat, which is an Alfred Hitchcock movie. I remember seeing him in that. But I, I and I knew his his second wife. Um, you know, when I was in my forties, I met her a couple of times, but I I never actually met Canada Lee. Okay, I see, I see. Um, well, you you definitely uh. I obviously in, include him in some interesting ways in the graphic novel, which we can. Oh yeah. 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 Um, but before we get, you know, before we see more of the graphic novel or maybe, maybe we will with this question, uh, where's what first got you interested in the history? Um, and how did you start learning about it? You know, at least the first stages of learning about it, learning more about it. Well, my dad used to quote Macbeth and used to quote, you know, Shakespeare from time to time. And, you know, I didn't really have any sense of who Shakespeare was, obviously, until I went went to school. And then, oh, yeah, Shakespeare, he's, you know, a great playwright, whatever. But even even at that point, you're sort of like, well, you know, this is old, old stuff. Who cares about, you know. But um, over the years, I became aware of, of Orson Welles. And became aware of the importance of this particular production. And, um, you know, seeing more and more of, of Orson's films and, you know, the Citizen Canes and the Touch of Evil. And one of the movies I saw that blew my mind was um, Chimes at Midnight, which is basically his um, taking all of the appearances of Falstaff from Shakespeare plays and putting them together into one movie. Yeah. And it's brilliant. It's amazing. And there was a, a guy named Harold Bloom, who was a professor of, of English and wrote several books. And he said that in his mind that uh, and Hamlet and Falstaff were amongst the greatest 
portraits of um of humanity you know just um expression of what you meant what what it means to be a human being bloom yeah. basically said that shakespeare invented the conception of of the modern conception of of a human because before that no one really had an inner life in in literature people didn't really delve into into what it meant to be a a person a complex individual until shakespeare and and as you as you have here on you know this the first page of the graphic novel we're showing even i mean orson wells 20 years old at at the time of you know being invited uh on board as far as this production of Macbeth. so i mean in some ways this is uh, a very fitting beginning for an incredibly rich career um, for him. I mean, I, I not entirely beginning, but you know, um, one of the first things that he was involved in. Um, so as far as your research for Voodoo Macbeth, um, why don't you talk a little bit about where it took you on a kind of developmental level? You know, I mean, obviously there's, the purely, I guess you could say, more academic or historical aspect of things. Um, but since your father was involved in the production as well, I imagine there might be some interesting personal um, revelations that that came up. So, so yeah, just talk through the process of your research, where you were at the beginning, where you were at the end, and how you got there. Well, I saw, <clears throat> excuse me, I kept seeing movies like um, Tim Robbins' Cradle Will Rock that that kind of dealt with Orson in his uh, early career. And there was another movie called Orson Welles and Me, and the film was called Me and Orson Welles, or, you know, the, the other way around. And I kept seeing him being as depicted as this egotistical buffoon, you know, just a a nasty, unpleasant person. And I kept thinking, you know, here you have a chance to present, you know, with the greatest minds in theater and cinema of the 20th century. And you're like reducing him to this clown, clown like figure. And this is Tim Robbins, who I respect. I mean, he's a man with a brain. Why would he deal with this this person in this way? So I said, well, I started thinking about doing doing a treatment of of the making of this play. And um, I didn't really know where it was going. I didn't know other than the fact that my father was in it and he was gonna be one of the main characters. I didn't really know where it was going. So I kind of started out with, with Orson Welles and um, started researching. At the time, the internet didn't, this was around 1999, 2000. So the internet really wasn't the kind of thing where you could press a button and, and bring up and there was no YouTube, so you couldn't get that that clip of of the last five minutes of the play. Um, so I went to um, the uh, Schomburg collection in Harlem, and I went to the microfiche, and you have these old old boxes, and the, they weren't even on computers at the time. Nothing wow. was computerized; it was all on microfiche. Yeah. So I got all these clippings uh, from the. Um, uh, let's see. There's the Lafayette Theater. This is one of the first. That's Jack Carter and Edna Thomas. There's another uh, clipping. Um, so these were all um, these were all reviews or just. Um, Some more more of Jack Carter. Oh wow! He unfortunately, does not appear in that five minute footage because he had left the production at that point. And here's the uh, one of the original programs. Some uh, costume designs. Wow! And uh, so yeah, I was digging, digging through the archives basically. And so you know, I read the play. <clears throat> Excuse me. 
And I was just trying to find a way into the story. I didn't, as I said, I didn't know where it was going. Sure. So if you want to bring the first slide, the, the next slide after the. Absolutely. It's okay. uh, Go. with the shadow. Yeah. So I, I knew that he had um, played the shadow on the radio and he created the character of, there were, I'm not even, I'm not sure he, I don't think he created the character of the shadow. It was a pulp book, but he created the character of Lamont Cranston and he did the whole, who knows what evil lurks in the hearts of men. <laughs> and I thought, at the time, I'm really glad I, I, I included this because <clears throat> it's basically going going through the notion of the shadow in, in Jungian terms, you know, the shadow of the of the personality. Sure. And that kind of like is for literally foreshadowing this guy's journey into what the heart of darkness or whatever. And I, I knew that he'd been obsessed with he was going to do the heart of darkness before he did Citizen Kane, he was working on a treatment for this particular, this film. Yeah. And um, so I, I, this, I just, this was my way in. It's like, you know, where do I go? Okay. Ah. So, so if you go to the next, um, the next, uh, no one. Yeah. So, um, Again, I'm working from from the biography biographies. I I had um, I had Jack Houseman, John Houseman's uh, biography, and all of these you know mentioned my father in the production, and I had Simon Callow's book. I had about four biographies, and I'm going through them and just trying to you know what's what's my in, what's my in, and so it turns out that his wife Virginia is the one that. Um, decided to um, go for the Haitian angle. So basically, uh, she decides to, um, they decide to do uh, Macbeth as Henri Christophe, the, the ruler of Haiti. And so um, she kind of talks about um, his history and what happened to him and, and Orson is very excited and he decides to go that route. If anyone uh, wants me to stop or elaborate anything, but again, I'm, I'm kind of, at this point, I'm, I still don't know where I'm going in. I didn't know where I was going with this because I didn't know what it was going to be about. But sure. if you go to the next uh, slide, next slide, please. So here we introduce my father and Canada Lee. There's a shot of uh, the facade of the Lafayette Theater. And Canada Lee are, and uh, Eric are friends and they're talking about um, talking about auditioning for this play. And um, at this point in the story, uh, Jack Carter's already been cast. And my father makes a comment about how the guy that's playing Macbeth is almost white because he was very light skinned. And uh, so Canada says, well, yeah, look who's talking, Arab, because my father was kind of tan. He wasn't compared to Canada Lee. He, he wasn't a, a dark man. Um, so they're, they're introducing those characters. But at this at this point, I'm still working on my, you know, my father. Sure. And uh, trying to figure out who's who and what's what and, and where am I going with this. So um, I don't think the next slide has. Yeah. So this is jumping ahead. But prior to this, you have um, you have auditions for um, for the character of Banquo. Orson is um, auditioning actress for Banquo. And he auditions uh, Canada Lee. And Orson is very impressed. First, he's talking about how um, he's not really sure about the direction because he has, with Black actors, he has all these different uh, accents and ways of speaking. Not many people are classically trained and he's getting frustrated because he doesn't, you know. And then he he sees Candidly and is like the first guy that he thinks, oh, okay, this guy's got some charisma. 
and he's still auditioning Banquo. He auditions my father for Banquo, but he has this notion at this point, rather than my father is Banquo, that he's going to cast him as the male version of, of Hecate. He's going to cast Hecate as a voodoo priest. And then he starts getting further and further into the whole uh, voodoo angle. Um, but again, I think just around this point, I realized, so this is this is kind of a, a, fa a fanciful uh, introduction to like the stage. Obviously, at this point, the sets are much too elaborate. So it's sort of like a notion of, um, you know, the way it might be. It's like you're suddenly entering, they're, they're still uh, doing rehearsals, but you suddenly entered the world of um, of the actual, you know, the forest. And uh, you first see Hecate. And I started thinking about, well, well, well wait a minute, this, this is supposed, to, you know, my father's one of the characters, but this this is supposed to be about Macbeth. You know, it's it's called Macbeth, so it's got to be about Macbeth. So at that point, I suddenly realized, aha, now I know where I'm going. And the fact that he was a light-skinned man of color, I locked onto that as a as an extension of myself because not. No one could ever mistake me for being black. Um, but I I had the issues of somebody, you know, with a mix with mixed race heritage, you know, um dealing with not people not knowing who I was, but me knowing, and it's like, well, you know, how are people gonna deal with this? And at a certain point, um later on. Jack Carter makes a, makes a speech about um oh, yeah anyway um you know, let's move on let's move on to the next but it's like I said if if there's any 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 you want me to stop or elaborate on let me know good for now so, and then yeah so we're at rehearsals now and um, they're coming out of rehearsal and uh, Canada Lee and Orson and Erica walking out of the theater and this this knife wielding guy attacks Orson Welles and uh, I candidly decks him knocks him down and um Orson is like shocked he's shaken it's like well, well what, what you know why, why would they want to attack me and and Eric says well you know you're a long way from home this is Harlem and I've got a sort of a a comic book trope here where where you use um the scenery to kind of comment on the situation like you have a corner of the Lafayette theater and it just says laugh so it's sort of like ah. you know, the gods are laughing at at uh, at this this guy who has the hubris to stage this play he's he's kind of out of his depth at this point so <laughs> <laughs> well, well, that's uh, uh, we'll keep on progressing with the slides, but there's uh, an interesting question in there about the influence of of comic books. Obvi I mean, obviously, it's a graphic novel, so there's got to be some influence. But you're a lifelong comic book lover as well, so why don't you just as a as an aside talk a little bit about that before we keep on progressing? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, um, let's see. Let me refer to my notes. So as you say, I grew up um, reading comics and at a certain point, about nine or 10 years old, I discovered uh, Jack Kirby, who was probably one of the most creative uh, characters in in the history of comics or even, you know, at some point when, when we recognize that um, art is art and you know, all of these distinctions that are made about, you know, illustration or, you know, fine art. Anyway, he I consider him a creative genius just in terms, not, not only in terms of drawing, but plotting, characterization. Um, and uh, 
I started doing comics when I was about, you know, some form of comics. When I would, whenever I would draw, it would always be illustrative. There would always be a story there. Yeah. And then I started reading more about Orson and um, the fact that um, he was interested in film, but he was also interested in in all forms of uh, popular culture and particularly in in comics. And um, I'm going to quote you um, from a, a 2012 article uh, written by a very good friend of mine, Stephen Brower. Sure. He wrote an article. He's a graphic designer, award-winning graphic designer. He wrote a book called The Touch of Wells, or it was an article, sorry. And uh, so here's the quote. Wells remained true to his populist roots throughout his life. A 1942 press release written by the publicity department of RKO Radio Pictures, to whom he was under contract states, Wells was a big man, well over six feet, who tips the scales at around 200 pounds. He is an avid reader of comic strips and particularly fond of Terry and the Pirates. He believes the comic strips mirror contemporary American life. Brower continues, Wells cared little for what others considered high art versus low art and took his unabashed love of popular forms of storytelling with him to Hollywood. He disliked the pretensions of intellectuals while at the same time was dismayed at the irony between what was considered high and low and what was considered to be art at all. Wells applied dramatic devices taken directly from comics to his films. For example, the clock tower ending of the film, The Stranger, was a device used many times in the 1940s by Batman writer and co-creator Bill Finger. As Wells notes, it was pure Dick Tracy. I had to fight for it. Everyone felt, well, it's bad taste and Orson's going too far, but I wanted a straight comic book finish. Wow. Uh, so let me quote myself. Um, as someone who has attempted to express himself with the techniques of sequential art, I've always been aware of the relationship between film and comic art. I was always particularly impressed with the job of film editor and how much, as it is in comics, the pacing and quality of drama is affected by the juxtaposition of sequen sequenced images. Not only that, but the size, shape, and particular focus, whether one used close up or a long shot, et cetera, all of that affected the pace and drama of the story. And I read a, a book by a guy named Walter, Walter Murch, who was a film editor who worked on Godfather uh, one and two and um, several other films, the, the conversation. Well said this about editing. For my style, for my vision of the cinema, editing is not simply one aspect, it's the aspect. The notion of directing a film is the invention of critics. It isn't an art, or at best, it's only an art, only one minute a day. It's an mm -hmm. art, only one minute a day. That minute is terribly crucial, but it occurs very rarely. The only time one is able to exercise control over the film is in the editing. The images themselves are not sufficient. They are very important, but they're only image images. What's essential is the duration of each image and that which follows each image. The whole eloquence of cinema is that that's achieved in the editing room. Wow. So anyway, that kind of ties together, you know, my, my sort of obsession with with sequential art and comics and film. It does, it does. Well, and, and it all came together in this project and in a way for you. Um, let's see, let me uh, go to the next slide here. So at this point, um, there's an accident um, during uh, rehearsals and a stagehand uh, falls and breaks his neck. And Wells starts talking about the whole uh, voodoo, the whole Macbeth 
curse and um you know bad luck things that that attend performances and he uh he's talking about expanding the role of um of Hecate and he's giving him more lines and um making his his um his role larger and so at that point I I'm kind of like starting to deal with characters and how they impact other characters and how the 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 roles that they play sort of move around and replace one another and I think this the next page um should be um should follow up on that concept that notion the next slide okay do you see yeah, that at this page? point at this point um sorry at this point jack carter is is having an affair with um with a young woman whose father is a, a mafia don and mm -hmm. this guy is trying to get jack carter to work for him ah uh... and so you, you you have this notion of these different characters that are trying to seduce, and I don't mean in a sexual way, I mean to try to, to um, manipulate is a better word. And and the whole, the whole story sort of goes in the direction of um, like who's zooming who, who's manipulating who. Um, what did I write here? Uh, much of the story's action takes place during production rehearsals with, with Wells giving stage direction to scenes that evoke special relationships between the actors and their roles on and off stage. As Macbeth, Jack Carter is the protagonist and a key subplot concerns his romantic involvement with the daughter of a ma mafia capo, Don Cellini, a somewhat sympathetic and reasonable underworld figure. Cellini is rather fond of Carter and at, at one point offering a job in organized crime. So we here we have the reoccurring motif of characters being seduced or led astray by other characters. Is Cellini or Wells Mephistopheles to Car Carter's Faust or is Wells Faust being drawn further into hell by Carter or by the momentum of the production? Ah. Um, so yeah, at this point, I'm I'm riffing on relationships and dealing with with the whole notion of you know selling one's soul or you know being manipulated by a a dark force. Yeah, and it's it's interesting because, like you said, there's there's no simple notion of who's who's selling whose soul or who's being manipulated. Uh, it's all a kind of a, a relational uh complexity in, in all of it where <laughs> hard to tell who's who's doing what right yeah so i'm not i think the next so at this point we're jumping ahead um um i'll just go through i probably should have sent you some more slides but um that would have taken forever but the production continues and um, it's it opens, there's opening night. Oh, let me, okay, the, there we these, go. These photographs, when I first saw them were like incredibly rare, but all of a sudden they started popping up. So I, I basically drew and re, reinterpreted these, these photographs. Ah. Uh, but they pretty much are you know, drawings of, of actual photographs, which are pretty easy to find now. Sure. Um, so anyway, the, the production opens and it's a su success and all of these great reviews start popping up. But one reviewer, a guy named Percy Hammond, um, says that it's um, deluxe boondoggling and Blacks should be confined to playing only Black subjects. And Jack Carter gets really upset. Uh, the voodoo priest asks Orson Welles if he wants to do Berry Berry on the man, put a curse on him. And 
<laughs> or some kind of joke when he says, oh, yeah, go ahead, do all the berry berry you want, you know. Anyway, there's this character that's in love with um, Don Cellini's daughter and resents, is, resents Carter's very existence. And um, in, that, in that slide, Carter is um, complaining and he says, um, don't you see, Lana, this critic is trying to destroy everything. When I came, I came here when I was 18 and I didn't know a damn thing about race, came from France. When I found out, I told people here that my mother was colored. I saw the difference that that made. And I made damn sure that everyone here knows I'm black. Um, uh, at that point, um, this guy breaks in and there's a fight and something tragic happens. So actually, um, she um, ends up killing this guy. So she's kind of like the stand-in for Lady Macbeth. Uh -huh. I mean, I could I could have kind of focused on Edna Thomas, but I just went in this direction. So sure. Um, so. Um, Jack Carter isn't seen at the at this crime. He he gets out without being noticed. She goes out the window with the guy and, you know, they're both dead. And he comes on stage and he's doing this scene about when Lady Macbeth dies. She uh, killed herself and uh, he's reading the scene and he, he um, now in actual fact, he walked off stage in the middle of production and nobody knows why. Um, it was a mystery. He disappeared for a year. So he's he's doing the whole um, tomorrow, tomorrow, creeps on this petty pace from day to day. And he, he just breaks down and he walks off in the middle of the scene and disappears. And he's he's gone for a year and nobody knows where he's gone now, at that at this point that was the end of the of my graphic novel sure uh, and the last line was my father saying the charms wound up so when i submitted it to Barris, barry renshaw i have to thank him because he said you know i like this and i want to publish it but i don't like the ending so I went digging, like, what am I going to do? I, you know, well, how am I going to end this? I thought I thought it, this was a good ending. I thought it was good. So I start reading more about what happened, and it turns out that uh, Carter turned up a year later, and they did Faust. And so, you know, it's perfect. It's like a bookend. You start with one, you know, one production, and then it goes in a circle, and you know you're back, and you've got uh, Carter Carter playing Mephistopheles, and Wells playing Faust. Uh -huh. And so Carter uh, Faust says to Mephistopheles, "I charge thee to wait upon whilst I live to do my bidding, etc." How comes it that you are out of hell? And uh, so Faust says, "Well, this is hell, nor am I out of it." So it, it's again, it's like Wells had this obsession with um, selling his soul, basically. And um, his his mother was actually, uh, his grandmother was a witch and she practiced in the in the attic and kind of, he, he would have nightmares about his grandmother and would freak him out. So yeah. he, he carried this, this with him. And, you know, he goes to Hollywood and he he's successful. He makes Citizen Kane, and and the world is at his feet. And you know he keeps making these strange movies that are not successful. They're not commercial, and he he he's never able to reach his potential. Although decades later, you know the critics are are saying, well, you know this is an amazing. This is amazing. The guy is a genius. But he dies, you know, in his late 60s or 70, and he's like, he weighs 400 pounds, and he's, you know, 
was he a success? Was he was he a failure? Did you know? Obviously, he's not a failure, but I think, yeah, he never quite. Um, you know, what does it mean to? What is success? I mean, is it? Um, you know, he ended up doing commercials for. You shall sell no wine before it's time, or he would play. He said they they would call him up and and give him a role to to speak a couple of lines to give um to give some prestige to some crappy production. Yeah. So and uh, and then you have people making movies of of him as a character as this you know <laughs> drunken fool. So anyway. Yeah. My my idea was somehow to to tell a story to shed some light on the human condition and specifically on on Wells as an artist and you know. So why don't you talk a little bit about um uh and there's there's many significant characters or multiple significant characters in the graphic novel of course but why don't you talk a little bit about um uh what the what the process was like for writing your father's character and um, the relationship between that characterization and, you know, how you knew your father growing up. I mean, you know, they, they could be very different. Um, just yeah. To, yeah. I, I may have backed away from him, from, from his character and, and decided to make him more of a, a representational figure, more as a, you know, uh, an archetypal figure. Sure. Um, he was a very dramatic, sort of mysterious, intellectual, very inner, you know, somewhat repressed. He he never really, re again, he's someone who never really reached his potential. Um, he, I think a lot of his friends, Canada Lee and... Um, uh, who's the guy? Uh, Ruby, uh, Ossie Davis was a good friend of his. And, you know, these, they would say, you know, why you, you know, he, he didn't, he was unable to, um, assert himself as an actor. And obviously it was a difficult time back then for, for African-American actors. Cause basically back then you had, you had Ossie Davis, you had Sidney Poitier, you had Harry Belafonte, um, but there were very few leading men characters or, or very few positive role models for black actors, like like certainly nothing close to today. Um, sure. And um, I, I don't know. Um, I, 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 in retrospect... I could have um, given him a bigger role, but his role in the play was symbolic and representational. And that's right. I just made a decision to make make the arc of the story about about Macbeth and and try to um, try to craft a, a story that ran parallel to Macbeth as the production was unfolding. Absolutely. And, uh, you know, Carter was was a stand in for me in a sense, but he was also, you know, the leading leading character as Macbeth and Wells. You know, Wells, it was about Wells and, and his quest for, you know, artistic. He was just coming into his own trying to figure out what the hell he was doing and where he was going. And there are scenes when Carter takes him to Harlem and takes him to like night spots and shows him around. And so it's again, you know, people leading people down paths and, and for whatever reason, uh, success or failure, um, that's just the way that the character, my father's character in the story <laughs> turned out. Um, I could say, well, if I had to do it over again, but I honestly, I, I honestly don't think I, I could do, you know, this story just came out of me sequentially. It just kind of un, unwound the way it did. And, you know, they talk about 
uh, muses or automatic writing or but it's it's a mystery how I, I I did this in a sense I think a lot of artists will say that that's the case like how did I do that where did that come from you know did it come from my subconscious did it come from the akashic record you know what so well it's it's interesting to hear you talk through you know the process sequentially and as far as even you know the pages of the graphic novel goes because it's clear you know the complex story that you end up weaving it only emerged as you were you know in the writing process uh yeah, um, yeah. it yeah. was pretty linear yeah it basically i went one page at a time i i except for the you know the last page and even the last page was done last yeah i mean i don't i can't think of a point where I went back and added a page. It just yeah. kind of, it was like a thread that I was following. And, uh, you know, it just went where it went. Absolutely. Well, so before we turn it over to Q&A, the last question I have for you, and then if, you know, if you want to add anything on your own, um, you can feel free to do so as well as, as more, uh, you know, general questions. Um, uh, what do you enjoy most about, the writing and illustration process and and what were some of the most challenging aspects of it for you? Um, I enjoyed prior prior to this project, I was working on a story that I was working on this particular story for about seven years and not this story, but because this took me a little over a year to do. But this particular story, and it was sort of like a master's degree process, because I was studying painting and drawing, and I was doing everything uh, in acrylic glazes and using photographs and airbrush airbrush uh, screens. And, and I was really, really working deeper and deeper into my processes but it never I never finished it because it, it kind of collapsed under its own weight but at that point I felt like I had a I had a um a way of working that I knew that I could if I if I had you know the the wherewithal the um the ideas that I that I knew that I could see it through because because I'd spent basically seven years to eight years studying everything I could about storytelling. So what I enjoyed was, you know, looking for reference, trying to understand characterization, trying trying to create characters that felt somewhat realistic to me and develop developing their characters developing their physical personalities you know so that when i would draw them for the most part they would look like who they were supposed to because i'd already kind of been working with photographs and working with them um, with a lot of reference and um, i enjoyed working with shakespeare you know um, I enjoyed trying to find passages in Shakespeare that would mirror the um, the story. You know, if, if I chose a line from Shakespeare, it, it had to be somehow what relevant to what was happening in the story rather than just a quote. You know, oh, let's throw some Shakespeare on the page to make it, you know, yeah, lit literature. Um, and I think that tomorrow and tomorrow thing kind of felt like the culmination of that. Like, you know, when you get to a point in your life when everything just seems like empty and meaningless and you, you know, don't understand what, what it's all about type thing. Yeah. So it's like, you know, if a man is on stage speaking those lines because he's an actor, but at that moment, he's also actually 
has just lived had an incident that makes him sort of you know that whole feeling come to the fore you know so it was about sort of interpret interpreting using the shakespeare language to um you know elucidate the story and i really liked orson wells as a character as this flawed kid who's like doesn't know what the fuck he's doing yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Like, he he's like being you know drag he's being being drawn into this world and he's like he's 20 years old and he's you know who is this guy um and uh you know how do i make him a, a believable character how do i make these people believable characters yeah sure um and and what about uh, any any challenging aspects? Uh, it may, maybe there weren't any challenging aspects. Oh no, no, it was all challenging. <laughs> <laughs> sure. Yeah. Um, yeah, because you know who the hell am I to like take characters that existed and like create suppositional frameworks around them oh this this i mean i'm not saying this actually happened this could have been what happened i mean that just seems to be like you know monumental arrogance to do that and sometimes i'm like totally appalled and regretful for having done that because it's you know don't would i like it if somebody just oh let's take norris burrows and put him in this you know make him do these things you know <laughs> anyway yeah. It's too late. I can't, you know, I can I can tell I can destroy all the copies and tell everybody just to, you know, make it go away. But you know, <laughs> it's a bit too late for that. Yeah. Well, I, I think as a testament to your uh, not only artistry as an illustrator, but artistry as uh, a composer of stories in general, you know, the, the characters in the graphic novel come out as multidimensional, complex human beings. And I, I feel like that's the best that uh, any creator of stories can aim for. I mean, you know, it's the mono-dimensional, you know, uh, kind of black and white characterizations of, uh, 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 of, you know, individuals and stories that are boring and end up doing violence to the legacies of those people. So, you know, you created complex characters. That's saying a lot. Um, yeah, that's well, my opinion. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, well, great, Norris. Um, I think in the interest of time, we'll go ahead and uh and start the Q and A portion for about twenty twenty five minutes. Uh, and uh, feel free for those of you who are still on to add you know Q and As directly into the Q and A section. There's a few that are already here. Um, let's see. One and and like I said at the beginning of, um, uh, of this program, as long as people are comfortable with it, we'll ask you to come on the screen and and ask the questions that you'd like. Um, if if you're not comfortable with it, then uh, then just let us know and we'll take you back off. But the first one, um, is from Norris. I think it's your cousin, uh, Kate. Let me see. Is that your cousin, Kate Connell? Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. And Kate has a few questions. Some of them are about wanting to see closer ups of some of the photos you were showing. But I'll we'll ask Kate to come on and uh, uh, and talk more about that. Let's see if Kate's still on. Yeah. All right, Kate. You. I think you can unmute unmute your microphone and. You should be able to ask Norris directly now. Hey, Norris, can you hear me? Hey, Cuz, hey, how's it going? <laughs> it's so great to hear you talk about all this about your life. I mean, it's so much that I hadn't heard before, and I think I was also mistaken. I thought that your dad what had played Macbeth, so this is this is cool to hear how he played this other character and just the whole complexities and all your what you had to say about your own life and kind of the allegories um, of creating this uh, with 
um, you know, the story of Shakespeare and the whole process of how this happened. Um, yeah, no, I hadn't, you were talking about the photographs of different people earlier, but your comic book was up on the screen. So, um, I guess I'm just curious, you know, obviously your father got involved in this pretty, um, uh, pioneering, I guess is for lack of a better word thing that happened with this person's idea, the woman's idea, and I'm forgetting who she was. She was like Orson Welles's girlfriend or something. Came up with this idea. Of yeah, the... Virginia, his his wife, his 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 wife at the time, his first wife. Right. How, and how did you even find out all of that information, like that kind of biographies? Ah, uh -huh. I've got I've got three or four biographies of Wells that I read, you know, pretty extensively. Yeah. But that that was pretty well known that she was um, the inspiration for the whole Haitian voodoo thing. Was she young Haitian. like him? Was she that were they both just? Yeah. Um, there's a picture of her. She kind of looked like that, um, like that. She was dark hair, slender. There was a photograph of her in one of the books I had. I mean, I know your sister Carola was doing had, you know, she'd started that whole Facebook page about about your dad. Was this did you do this graphic novel before or sort of in parallel with when Carola was putting that together? I know she's working a lot on the history and I know it was so I started uh, around the year 2000. Uh, there was no Facebook. I don't remember Facebook being around much before 2007, 2008. Which maybe it started in 2005. The Facebook page only went up about maybe five or six years ago. But I, I really, I really appreciate that she did that. Um, there was a. Um, I was contacted by a member of the Communist Party about Williana, my grandmother. And I arranged to have a Wikipedia page on my father as a result of talking to this guy. So there's a Wikipedia page on Williana, Williana Burroughs. And then there's also a Wikipedia page of Eric, which I put up and then uh, and then Corolla added some information too. And then she she did the Facebook page of Norris Bar uh, excuse me, Eric Burroughs actor. But that's fairly recent. Yeah, Any no, other questions, Kate? No, no, that's great. Thank you. Thank All right, you. Great, great talking to you. Yeah, it's wonderful to see the comic book. I, and I Thanks. see there's a link getting it. Are, can we get it signed if we purchase the comic? Uh that would be a little complicated because you'd have to send it to me and the postage here is very expensive. <laughs> yeah, it's actually it's actually coming from from the UK. Um, it's five pounds, so it's a very, very it's a beautiful little uh, graphic novel, but very affordable. Um, yeah, I think the shipping I, I, is more postage. expensive than the book. <laughs> That's right. That's right. OK. Yeah, sorry but, about that, Kate. I. I I would have a hard time doing that. Okay. No worries. Okay, okay. we're gonna move on to, let's see, I think this is more a comment um, uh, from Yelena Demikovsky. Um, Yelena, if you're still on, and if you'd like to um, come on camera to say more about this, then just indicate so in the Q&A. Um, but otherwise, I'll just read your comment. Uh, Williana went to the Comintern Congress in 1928 in the USSR, then right. came there again in 1937 with the boys. Um, and if I remember correctly, you can it, if this doesn't ring a bell to you, Norris, you can correct me or we can look more into it. But I, I think when Williana was in New York City, I, she, I think if I remember correctly, she was a public school teacher, at least off and on. Yes, right? yes. Yeah. So, uh, so Elena is making a film on Black Russians, which were African Americans who went to Russia 
in that period and my my grandmother was one of them so so Yelena does um cover she knows a lot about my family based on that particular experience. ah okay well thank you Yelena for uh adding that in okay let's see here's another question um this person doesn't wish to come on camera it's from Marion Swerdlow uh oh. and she went to elementary and high school with your sister, I think, Marissa. Yes. Yes. Uh, did anything happen to Eric during McCarthyism, the Red Scare? Well, my father wasn't a communist. Um, a, a lot of the people in the coops, Judy Winston's father was was imprisoned and went blind in prison. He, he was a communist. Uh, I think my father used to write letters. I have a letter that he wrote to Nixon, and Nixon responded very eloquently. Um, but my father would send letters to people, but um, I think we might have been under investigation briefly, but um, there was no real intervention like a lot of the, a lot of the, the friends in the coops um, were would would like pick up the get get a phone call pick up the phone and hear strange clicking noises and, you know. uh -huh. <laughs> that's right that's right and and even 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 for those who weren't communist uh uh often it had very little bearing if someone was or wasn't a communist as far as <laughs> if they'd be under investigation um all it took was you know an accusation or if someone was even marginally involved in some type of civil rights uh action so so yeah i'm sure your father i'd, I'd have to look but I, I imagine your father probably has at least some type of fbi file full yeah, of he wasn't political but he he wrote letters um he wrote letters to congressmen and like, like i said nixon but i love the letter that nixon sent back to him I, and i could read it but it's it's like this guy is seriously engaged in responding to this person that sent him this letter and is explaining, he was vice president at the time, explaining the policy in a very like forthright, open, congenial, like I want you to understand, you know, Nixon has a reputation of being like the ultimate scumbag, but you know, I love the fact that I have a document showing that you know despite of all his flaws he was a, a human being who cared what people thought of of him and his policies sure sure yeah 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 um okay let's see other other q and a's uh uh let's see people who are here feel free to add them in um and i might i might put a couple people on the spot that I see on just so they can come and, and say hi to you, Norris. Yeah, come um, on. Don't be scared. <laughs> let's do Joellen. Joellen, I'm going to put you on the screen. I hope you don't mind. And if you do, you can yell at me later. He's not... Hi, Joellen. Can you hear us? I can hear you. Let's see if you can hear me. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Okay, cool. I'm here. Should I close off this? I guess so, right? Uh, let's see. Here we As I walk hey. the world, nothing can stop the Duke of O. There you are. Hi, baby. How are you I'm okay. Hey, what what do I have to press here? Anything now? I don't think so. I think yeah. You, you okay, can... good. Okay, I'm dressed. Hi. Hello. We can't <laughs> see your face. I don't know how to do that. Where where to do yeah, this? You might not be. We for some. You might not be able to see your video, but we can okay. hear you. But you can um, hear me. Okay. Yeah. That's cool. Hi. So are you going to come to the Coops, Mar Norris? Uh, well, I can't actually leave the country for a while because oh, my immigration status is pending. But I would love to, sooner or later, come back and, and have a look. And, um, you know, we were toying with the possibility of getting a place there and you know it's not out of the question but at this point i am i'm gonna have to be a uk resident for at least uh till the summer if not longer 
I'm starting to acclimate to this place. So yeah, you, well, you it's seem nice. To it's quiet, that. which I like. Well, the coops isn't quiet. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think one of the things that I, I think Norris and I have spoken about before, and it, it'll be interesting to hear the two of you speak about because. I don't think Nor Norris, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think you were probably too young to have seen um Reg's uh murals in the basement of the coops. Did did you ever see those? He's way too young. I didn't oh. see him. You didn't you didn't yeah, see him. No. no, it was way I remember young. Jimmy Jurgens. That's the only, only coop artist I, I remember seeing. Uh, okay. I see. Yeah, but so you know, so many art so many artists and, and different people with creative talents to to come out of the coops and for those of you listening in joellen's longtime partner um reggie uh was an artist as well and and painted murals in the basement of the coops at one point well, do you remember and, and, what were they of joellen do you remember did reggie he said forget? they were murals yeah so, uh, yeah so what i was i i never saw him you have to ask that to uh turner uh, to charles and to um Chuck Tommy, Turner, right? Tommy oh, was, yeah, right? Tommy. Because I never saw them. I mean, that was before I was born. But you know, Norris, did you know G Gary Smith, Reggie's son? Mm, doesn't ring a bell. He lived in the same building as Charlotte, up on the top floor. He played okay. a lot of basketball. I, if I were to see him, I might recognize right, him. Right, right. Well, he's no longer with us, so you'd have okay, to see yeah. pictures. Yeah. Just curious. Um. Well, uh, well. Anyway, uh, everyone should keep uh, keep their eyes out. People who attended tonight, because later on, um, maybe in in March or April, Joellen and I still have to work out the date. But Joellen will be giving a, a an artist talk. Oh, well. I am. <laughs> okay. <laughs> didn't Little did you know, Joellen. But Joellen's an artist too. So, um, and you can for those of you who are in the New York area, you can you can view um, both. Norris's graphic novel, as well as Joellen and, and Reg's art at the exhibit at the Museum of Bronx History. So please come check it out. Um, Joellen, uh, I, I guess I'll go ahead and, and take you off now and we'll see if there's any other Q and A's before we wrap it up. So that sound good, Joellen? Yes, sounds fine. Bye, Norris. Bye-bye, great talking to you. <laughs> Wonderful. Okay, any final Q and A's? Oh, oh one um, added, okay. I'll just go ahead and answer this live. Um, what are the dates of the exhibition? So the exhibition, one second, let me just, uh, I'll uh, put a link here for people. One second. Okay, so originally the exhibition opened in August. If you just go to our homepage, which the link is here in the chat, um, and if you scroll down to events, it has events and ongoing exhibits. You can also find, you know, updates about when exhibits will close. But originally, the Coops exhibit was supposed to come down at the end of March, and another exhibit was supposed to go up in April. That exhibit just got pushed back um, for a few reasons. So the Coops exhibit will be up at least through uh, mid-May right now. There's a chance it might even be up through the end of May. So there's plenty of time to come and see it. Um, our address, I'm going to type it in here um, for the museum. It's 3266 Bainbridge Avenue. That's, of course, in the Bronx. Um, and we're about, I think, about a mile, mile and a half uh, west of the Allerton Coops. So if you really want to be ambitious, you can come to the museum and then walk walk to the coops down Bainbridge and through Bronx uh, Bronx Park. Um, but I encourage all of you to come and check it out. And also just to put one more thing on people's radar, um, February 25th is a Sunday, 3 p.m. Uh, Charles Turner, uh, Joellen just mentioned him, another person from the coops, will be doing a one-person dramatic reading uh, around the life of Paul Robeson, um, mm. here in the Bronx. You can check that out on the website as well. And we'll we'll have a recording of that also. I'll make sure to send that to you, Norris. But um, for the rest of you here, if you're not able to be here in person, we'll have a recording of it as well. Um, Museum of Bronx History. That's right, Kate. 
Okay. Um, so I think we'll go ahead and wrap it up and just want to express uh, my uh, great appreciation for you, Norris, uh, um, not only for sharing everything you shared today, but for producing Voodoo Macbeth. Um, it's definitely worth people purchasing a copy. Um, if you're not too familiar with, um, you know, if you haven't read graphic novels before, this is a great place to begin, at least in my opinion, it offers a lot for, um, uh, for, you know, a lot of different people, you know, if you're into Shakespeare, if you're into the history of cinema, if you're into complex stories in general, it's definitely worth checking out. Um, and, uh, thank you so much, Norris. Do you have any, uh, final, uh, final bits of, uh, uh, wisdom to to leave us with tonight well other than i appreciate uh, everything you've done uh both from the uh earlier exhibition that you did and the questions that probing questions that you asked back several months ago and uh and this uh appreciate you having me on thank you norris well hope and thanks for putting the bronx on the map because um bronx doesn't get enough respect that's right. Little do people know <laughs> what what's come out of the Bronx. Um, uh, uh, really, There's really. The Wanderers, one of my favorite movies. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, maybe maybe and we'll book, Richard Price book. Maybe maybe we'll do um a, a virtual screening of that at some point in the near future too. I think it's worth doing that because that's a very interesting movie. Um, very interesting piece of cinema. So, uh, all right, everyone. We'll we'll hope you all have a great night. And I'll share this recording with all of you who have joined tonight and feel free to share with what, uh, with anyone you'd like, um, probably be in the next day or two when that recording will be ready. All right. Hello to you too, Thomas McGuire. Someone just added a Q and a, okay, great. All right. Well, good night, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you very much.